Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on mental health during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is such an important topic, and we are glad to be able to contribute to the greater conversation around mental health and construction. I'm Chris Kane, Executive Director at CPWR, the Center for Construction Research and Training. As most of you probably know, CPWR and NIOSH are holding this bi-monthly COVID-19 webinar series for the construction industry. You can access recordings from the whole series through a playlist on our YouTube channel. These are challenging times we're living in, and we all know this firsthand by now. The mental health of many is being impacted by this pandemic. And in an industry where workers already faced higher than average risks for opioid addiction and suicide, this is a huge concern. You'll hear more about the numbers as well as ways and resources to help from our panelists today, who I'm pleased to introduce. Many of you recognize my counterpart on this webinar series, Dr. Scott Ernest, Associate Director for Construction in NIOSH's Office of Construction, Safety, and Health. Scott will kick us off with a short presentation today and will also be moderating the Q&A session at the end. We'll also hear from three panelists. Dr. Douglas Wygand is a behavioral scientist in the Division of Field Studies and Engineering at NIOSH. Dr. Anne-Marie Dale is a professor at Washington University School of Medicine. And Randall Kroka is the administrator of the Sheet Metal Occupational Health Institute Trust. After their presentations, we'll have some time for questions and answers. And now, Scott, I'll hand it over to you to get us started. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Chris. It's great to be with everyone. And um, I'm going to go through a number of different updates, the things that have happened uh, related to CDC and COVID over the, over the last week or so. First thing I wanted to just mention briefly to people is that there is some updated guidance on the CDC web page about cloth face coverings and specifically about um, uh, masks that have exhalation valves. Um, CDC has updated the policy to recommend that masks that have exhalation valves um, not be worn for source control because of potential for um, particles to be uh, exhaled through those, through those valves. I just wanted to mention that right up front that there has been an update on the uh, CDC webpage about that. Um, and then as far as uh, some of the other uh, things I just wanted to touch on briefly, it's a little bit about coronavirus, uh, a little bit about some of the updates on mental health and organiz organizational support. There's also been some recent uh, publications on CDC's uh, morbidity and mortality weekly report related to disparate risk for racial and ethnic minorities. So I wanted to briefly mention that. And then remind folks about the uh, falls campaign that we are uh, planning for next month. That's normally occurs the first week of May. It was uh, postponed because of uh, the pandemic and it's been rescheduled. So I just wanted to update everybody um, on what the plans are for that because it's going to be an uh, exciting event. So the first thing, uh, first thing that I wanted to talk about is some work that was published in CDC's MMWR within the last week and it had to do with um, mental health and substance use issues amongst U.S. adults um, during the pandemic. And so the uh, authors of this article, they did a survey of U.S. adults between June 24th and June 30th. And um, as part of that survey, they asked the individuals responding if they uh, considered themselves to have elevated um, adverse mental health conditions related to COVID-19. And so groups that uh, responded um, that they were, they were dealing with uh, issues or concerns in this area included younger adults, racial and ethnic minorities, essential workers, and unpaid adult care, caregivers. And so if you look at the uh, um, reporting that came out of this, there was approximately 31% of the respondents um, reported anxiety and depression symptoms related to the pandemic. There was also 26% of the respondents that reported stress-related disorders from, from COVID-19 and the pandemic. And then 13% of the respondents indicated they had increased use of uh, 
substances, and 11% mentioned considering suicide. These are all, you know, sort of mental health issues that were reported in this uh, MMWR article in, within the past week. Another thing that uh, has come out recently, this is a science blog on the NIOSH website. Um, it was posted just a few weeks ago. And basically what it talks about is that uh, in a time when workers are facing increased job and economic insecurity, issues related to work stability, and just, um, you know, feeling, not, not necessarily feeling hopeful about the future, there's a lot of things that supervisors need to consider. And among that, it's essential for supervisors to promote well-being through healthier work designs and in a way that supports workers' four primary needs. And those four needs are trust, compassion, stability, and hope. And so um, basically this, uh, this uh, science blog talks about a number of different things that supervisors can do to help their employees. This includes uh, scheduling frequent check-ins with their employees, trying to engage in positive social interactions on a regular basis, following best practices to avoid uh, late in the day or after hours uh, emails and interactions or meetings, um, trying to provide flexible work schedules, and also um, providing cross-training and opportunities for employees to trade shifts or, or be more flexible in the work that they do. So again, this is a science blog. If you want to actually read it, it's on the uh, NIOSH website. You can just search on the, uh, the title on this page. Also, just want to give a little bit of updates about um, <coughs> COVID in general. The data on this slide is from August 25th, so just a few days ago. And at that point, there were about 5.7 million total cases of COVID in the U.S. There were 176,617 deaths that were reported. And then the bar chart on this shows the percentage of deaths based upon ethnicity. So uh, as far as the, uh, the breakdown on those deaths, um, this chart shows that uh, approximately 50% of the deaths uh, occurred to white non-Hispanic individuals, 22% occurred to black non-Hispanic individuals, and 17% um, were Hispanic or Latino. So this is just um, data that was available and taken right off the CDC COVID data track. What I wanted to get into next is another article that appeared in um, the MMWR, the CDC's MMWR article um, that came out recently. And the title of that is Racial and Ethnic Disparities Among COVID-19 Cases in Workplace Outbreaks by Industry Sector. So I wanna emphasize this is not national data, this is data from the state of Utah. And so basically they, the folks that did this study looked at data from March 6th, June 5th of this year. They looked at workplace outbreaks occurring in a variety of different industry sectors in Utah. There were a total of 15 different industry sectors. And if you looked at all of the, all of the outbreaks that occurred, 58% of those occurred in three, three primary sectors. Those were manufacturing, wholesale and retail trade, and then also in construction. But the thing that was really pretty, uh, um, you know, telling or, you know, really, really a major concern here is that despite, um, despite representing 24% of Utah workers in all the affected sectors, Hispanic and non-white workers accounted for 73% of the workplace outbreaks from COVID-19. So again, there was a very big discrepancy or disparate risk between and 24% of the workers and the 73% of the cases where these outbreaks were occurring. Um, so this is a, you know, obviously a, a big issue. And then this is some of the um, actual data from the, uh, from the article. And I just wanted to point out, this is broken down by the industry sector. So on the left-hand side is the industry sector and right in the middle is the construction industry. So again, if you go, there's a line if you go to the far left, that shows that for the construction industry in Utah, approximately a little bit under 30% of the workers were Hispanic. But then in terms of the, the uh, 
Hispanics that actually were affected by workplace outbreaks, you go over to the right-hand side, and it's up around 70%. So that's the disparate risk. You would think if, if all things were equal, the, num the percentage of the employees would be the same as the percentage of outbreaks, but you got a huge in increase um, in the uh, impact of these outbreaks on Hispanic workers in the state of Utah. And then there's some additional data. This is a, another um, MMWR article that was recently published. Uh, this is looking at meat and poultry processing. And the main takeaway there is that uh, this is data from 23 different states in the meat and, meat and poultry processing facilities. They identified over 16,000 cases of COVID in 239 different facilities. And of those, of those cases, it resulted in 86 fatalities. But the, the big thing here, the, the disparate risk is the fact that of all, of all, the, uh, of all those cases that were reported, 87% of those affected racial or ethnic minorities. So again, just kind of an update on a recently published article from CDC. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and wrap things up here real quick, but I wanted to remind folks that we are planning the national safety stand down and campaign um, it's planned for the week of September 14th through 18th. We're going to have a big kickoff event with a, a very large um, uh, virtual audience on a Zoom platform. Um, so that'll be on Monday of that week, and we're going to have events planned really throughout the week on all sorts of different issues related to fall prevention and preventing, um, preventing uh, fatalities and injuries in the construction industry related to falls, because it is, it unfortunately continues to be the number one killer of construction workers. I just want to remind folks about that. And again, point everybody to um, where they can get more information about um, construction, COVID-19. There's the CPWR Clearinghouse that's continuing to be developed and updated. There's guidance from uh, NIOSH on the CDC website, uh, a number of different sources there. Um, also the OSHA construction information on COVID. And then last but not least at the bottom, is the CDC 1-800 number if you want to actually call somebody and talk to them. So with that, that's a wrap-up of my update, and I will um, go ahead and move on to our first uh, speaker, which is uh, Dr. Douglas Wiegand. And again, he's a behavioral scientist at NIOSH. Um, Dr. Wiegand, go ahead and uh, take it away. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you and present some of this basic guidance that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has made available on recognizing signs of stress and building resilience during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the information that I'll cover this morning is available on the CDC website, as you'll see right here on my, on my screen, and can be found by searching job stress on cdc.gov or CDC and job stress if you're doing a Google or other search. Um, I work for the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, which is part of the CDC. Um, both CDC and NIOSH have information about mental health, stress, and job stress on their websites. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the science of stress and how it's applied to occupational safety and health, um, I do encourage you to spend some time on the NIOSH website particularly the Healthy Work Design and Wellbeing page. Uh, once I'm done speaking, I will post some links in the comment box so that you can check those out if you haven't done so already. Um, generally speaking, stress is something that we all encounter. It's a natural biological reaction to our real or perceived environment. Stress sets off an alarm in the brain, which responds by preparing the body for defensive action. The nervous system is aroused and hormones are released to sharpen the senses, uh, get your pulse going, uh, deepen your respiration, and uh, bring blood to your muscles and, and tense those up. This response is sometimes called the fight or flight response, and it's important because it helps us defend, defend against threatening situations. So stress is a very natural thing, and it's not all bad. Um, in some circumstances, it helps keep us safe. Uh, sometimes stress can be a good thing. In, in that case, it's called eustress. And an example is when you're faced with a challenge uh, where you have the resources, skills, uh, support, and knowledge to address the situation. 
Eustress stress can have a beneficial effect on health, uh, your motivation, performance, and emotional well-being. So I mention this because I want to emphasize the point that stress in general is very normal. Um, unfortunately, though, I'm not here to talk about you stress or the benefits of stress, but rather the negative type of stress, which people commonly refer to when they talk about being, uh, quote, stressed out or having stress in their life. Um, I like to think of stress in this sense as a bodily or mental tension that results from factors that overwhelm an individual. Um, Short-lived or infrequent episodes of stress pose little risk to one's health. But when stressful situations go unresolved, the body's kept in sort of a, a constant state of act activation or hypervigilance, uh, which increases the rate of wear and tear to our bodies and our biological systems. Um, Becoming stressed and staying that way for a long while can have a cumulative effect on your body and mind. So how you cope with these emotions and stress can affect your well-being, the well-being of the people around you and that you care about. Uh, it can affect your work, uh, your workplace, and your community. As we continue to face the challenges of this pandemic, it's critical that you recognize what stress looks or feels like, that you take steps to build your resilience and manage stress, and that you know where to go if you need help. So if we look at this website, the first sort of uh, box here are some of the symptoms of stress that people may be experiencing. Now these, uh, these are all pretty general and they're the most common signs and symptoms of stress. It certainly doesn't you know, run the gamut of human emotion that can occur if someone is, is feeling stress, but these are some of the more common ones. So, um, a common one is feeling irritation, anger, or maybe even being on the edge of losing your temper. Um, another one is feeling sort of a general feeling of unease or feeling uncertain, nervous, or anxious. Um, one may have recurring thoughts that are intrusive or bothersome, sort of racing thoughts through your head. Um, some people may have some trouble getting going focusing or concentrating or lacking motivation to finish tasks. Another common sign is losing interest that one usually enjoys doing. You may feel unusually tired, overwhelmed, or burned out. Sadness and depression are other signs. Um, and stress often manifests itself in our sleeping behavior, too. Everyone is different, so one person may react to stress by sleeping more than usual, um, even having trouble getting out of bed in the morning, while others may have trouble getting any sleep at all and may spend uh, restless hours tossing and turning in bed, watching TV, or um, otherwise just not being able to get sound sleep. Another common sign of stress is an increase in alcohol, tobacco, or other substance use. Um, if this is the case, we do have um, some resources that are listed below on the same page. Um, so these are the common signs and symptoms of stress. Um, I want to express that these feelings are generally a normal reaction to an unusual situation. A person may experience one of these states or they may feel a combination of many of these things. Um, of course, experiencing these things does not indicate that one has a mental health issue, but they are signs that one's well-being is likely out of balance and needs attention. So if stress is so normal, then how do we know when it is something to be concerned about? The big thing here is that if symptoms begin to interfere with important aspects of one's life, such as with their work, um, with personal relationships, or even in taking care of oneself and uh, satisfying one's basic needs, then it's concerning and professional help should be sought. Okay, so um, those are some of the signs and symptoms of stress. What are some of the common stressors or factors that are associated with stress? Uh, well, you can take your pick as there seem to be plenty going on with the pandemic and how it is affecting work. Uh, we have school starting up and uh, it's just life in general. But uh, let's take a few minutes to talk about work though. Uh, whether you're reporting to the job in person or working from home, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has most likely changed the way you work. 
Some of these changes may be welcomed, while others could be quite stressful. What are some of the common work-related stressors we may be facing? Um, this list here uh, is meant to be very broad in nature. So again, it certainly doesn't cover everything, but these are some of the common stressors. And uh, I'm willing to bet everyone has experienced one or more of these in the past several months. A big one of concern is um, about the risk of being exposed to the virus at work. Am I safe? Uh, do I need to be on heightened alert all day? Those types of things. Uh, people may have concerns about following health and safety guidance and wonder if they're doing everything correctly to minimize exposures. Um, many of us are managing a different workload or a different schedule. Uh, personally, my workload has fluctuated a lot over the past few months. Uh, some of my normal job tasks have kind of taken a back seat so that I can focus on topics related to the pandemic. Um, I'll have times where I'll be extremely busy for days or weeks, but then that's followed by some lulls where I'm, you know, waiting for my next assignment, for example, where I can perhaps redirect my attention to less pressing tasks. Um, another big one, uh, many of us are adapting to a new work dynamic. So, for example, a new physical workspace, maybe you're working at your kitchen table now instead of uh, on a job site or in a cubicle or at a desk. Um, there's been a, a big switch for many to online meetings in which some people may not be quite experienced or comfortable with that yet. Um, it seems like there's a ton of different apps and technology out there to bring us together and have discussions. Um, you know, in a single day, you could have a meeting on Zoom and then an hour later, join another meeting that's on Microsoft Teams. It's, it's a lot to catch up with and, uh, and be able to figure out all, all the bugs and that kind of thing. Um, another big stressor is a lack of access to the tools and equipment needed to perform your job. This may be from not being in the office where everything you need typically is, or Maybe the suppliers that you work with are facing delivery issues and you're not getting the materials you need on time to do the job. Um, another big one that, that a lot of people are facing is uncertainty about the future of your workplace or your employment status. Uh, you may be having thoughts about how long the pandemic can go on, whether your job is sustainable. Uh, very serious concerns that, that a lot of people are having. Um, as you navigate further down the web page, you'll find some tips for building resilience and managing job stress. There's some really great strategies here and, and things to think about. Um, at the top is communication. Communication is key. Um, communicating with your coworkers, supervisors, and employees about job stress. It's important to be open about it, both in terms of how you talk about it and how you listen. Um, try to keep an open mind and uh, do your best not to, to judge or criticize other people's ideas or, or information that they share. Um, identify things that cause stress and talk about them. Work together to identify solutions and how to carry out those solutions. Talk openly with employers, employees, and unions about how the pandemic is affecting work. Um, it's very important that expectations be communicated clearly by everyone. Um, let's see here. Uh, um, another big thing is to identify those things which you do not have control over and do the best you can with the resources available to you. I can't encourage this enough. Um, a lot of anxiety and stress comes from fretting about things that we have absolutely no control over. Um, I know it takes a lot of practice, but being able to let go and, and focus on what you can influence is very beneficial. Um, one way to increase your sense of control is by developing a consistent daily routine when possible, ideally one that's similar to your schedule before the pandemic. And a big one here is sleep. Um, there is a lot of information out there about the importance of sleep and how it affects both your physical and mental health and vice versa, um, and there are some links. Uh, available here for you. Um, schedule time throughout your day to balance your work with enjoyable or relaxing activities. 
Um, exercise is a great way to reduce stress. Uh, try to get some outdoor time for some sunshine and fresh air. Um, and of course, working some time to spend with family and get your, your usual household tasks done. Um, another strategy is knowing the facts about COVID-19. Uh, be sure you're getting your information from reliable and credible sources. Um, be informed about how you can protect yourself and others. Uh, understanding the risk and sharing accurate information with people that you care about can help reduce your stress and, and that of others and, and help you make a connection with others as well. Um, I think it's important to remind yourself uh, that each of us has a crucial role in fighting this pandemic, uh, whether we're going in uh, to work in person or working from home, um, avoiding public, wearing masks, uh, following all the safety and, and health guidance that's available to us. Um, everyone's hopefully, you know, trying to do their part to, uh, to address the pandemic. Um, another big one is to remind yourself that everyone is in an unusual situation with limited resources. Um, hopefully, everybody's trying their best with what they've got, and I think it's good to uh, be mindful of this and to to be kind to others, uh, and also, of course, to be kind to yourself. Take it easy on yourself. Um, we're going through some hard times. Um, take breaks from watching, reading, or listening to news stories, including social media. Hearing about the pandemic over and over again can be pretty upsetting and mentally exhausting. Um, connect with others. Talk to people that you trust about your concerns, how you're feeling, or how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting you. Um, these days, we have all sorts of different ways that we can keep in touch with each other through the phone, email, text messages. Uh, if you're old school like me, you might write a letter or send a card. Uh, video chat, and of course, social media, keeping in mind uh, to balance those things out. And um, especially with social media, if you find that it's causing you more stress when you're, when you're engaging in those things, you might want to consider taking a break or deactivating your account. Um, if you feel that you may be misusing alcohol or other drugs, including prescription drugs as a means, as a means of coping, uh, please do reach out for help. Um, again, down here we have some more resources. Um, lastly, if you're being treated for a mental health condition, maybe something that was going on before the pandemic or something that's developed over these last few months, continue your treatment and be aware of any new or worsening symptoms. And be sure to communicate that to your your therapist, your your family doctor, or uh, whoever your trusted healthcare provider is. Um, at the bottom of the website here are some resources. Um, please take some time to review these, share them, uh, keep them handy, and refer to them often. Um, before I wrap up, I, I really want to draw some attention here to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, I know that some of the others on this panel will talk about warning signs, communication, and tools related to suicide prevention. Uh, so please stick around for that. Um, for now, I'd like to say that if you or someone you care about are experiencing or, or voicing thoughts about hurting themselves or others, please take it very seriously um, and take action to get the person help. This hotline and the Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention are invaluable resources. Um, our last talker today, Randy, will be talking more about the Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention and the resources and tools they have developed. So again, please stay tuned for that. Um, that's all I have. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, I will post some additional links into the chat box and I look forward to our discussion at the conclusion of this program. Thank you, Dr. Weekend, and we will move on to Professor Anne Marie Dale, and uh, there her slides are. So go ahead, Dr. Dale. Thank you, Scott, and thank you, Dr. Weekend. That was a great introduction to um, some of the issues that the construction industry is facing, and uh, we will be sharing some of those stories with you now. 
My name is Anne Marie Dale. I'm a professor at Washington University. Um, our team in St. Louis has uh, over 20 years of experience of working with the construction industry. And during this pandemic, we continue to work with our contractor partners, their workers, and other uh, construction organizations uh, in our region. And what I want to share with you is some of the information about what's happening in the field. But just to step back to reiterate a little bit about what Dr. Wiegand already, Dr. Wiegand and Scott already introduced, um, there was also a uh, CDC um, household pulse survey that is uh, given out on a regular basis. And um, this is showing the change in that anxiety and depression level that Dr. Wiegand just described. In 2019, the second quarter, you can see the percent of individuals that scored uh, having anxiety was 8.3%. And if you go to the right of that line, the seven-day average for the month of April was 30, almost 31%. So, um, you know, nearly four times as high in the month of April. If you continue to go to the right, since this information continues to be collected on a regular basis, that anxiety level is now even six points higher, almost six points higher. Now, if you walk down to the second line of depression in 2019, the percentage of individuals was 6.87%. In April of 2020, it was 24%. And now nearly 30% of the individuals that uh, um, completed the survey now fall under having uh, depressive symptoms. So the, the uh, symptoms are similar to the ones that uh, Dr. Wiegand just re de described, the fear of contracting COVID, job loss, reduced work hours, social isolation from friends, family, Increased family demands for homeschooling or uh, in-person schooling, getting children back and forth, but also uh, the need for cooking, home care, maybe that wasn't part of the routine. And finally, poor mental resiliency, particularly increased substance use. And so that use uh, has been illustrated a couple of ways in the data. Um, drug testing, uh, a drug testing company, Millennium Health, has reported that drug testing results is showing substantial increase in positivity rate for illicit drugs, fentanyl, compared to 20, the first and second quarter of 2020 is 561% higher in their data. And many other illicit drugs are also higher. So this is them, uh, illustrating the increase in drug use. That survey that uh, Scott reported at the beginning, I reiterate here, which is showing that uh, this is the MMWR report that just came out um, recently, um, and it's showing a 13% uh, of the individuals surveyed said that they had started or increased substance use to cope with uh, COVID. And then, of course, the concern for suicide is of uh, a big concern, and that 10 or nearly 11% that are reporting uh, suicide risk in the prior 30 days is significantly higher than uh, the normal rate that we had in our uh, nation, you know, last year and the year before. So, and of course, our youngest uh, workers are the ones that seem to show the highest rate. So more data that's showing the concern across the nation, but um, we are very concerned about that related to the construction workers. Before the pandemic, the construction workers had the highest rate of drug overdose fatalities and the highest suicide rate. This is a report that was also an MMWR that came out in January of this year that showed that construction workers 43.5 per 100,000 had committed suicide, which is significantly higher than the 14.2% uh, of the U.S. population. And that and that uh, suicide rate is um, higher across many of the, of the trades in construction, so it's not unique to one group. So what are the workers' concerns in construction? Um, as we've been communicating with, through our network, they obviously are concerned about contracting the virus because construction in many areas is considered essential work, particularly those who have to work close to where COVID patients 
are located, uh, whether these are hospitals or temporary uh, buildings. Job security is a big concern. Early on, the concerns for a work postponement or cancellation from workers and owners, and then now more recently, the supply of material has been slowed and interrupted. And as the projects go on, there's been uh, concern for lost time due to having COVID themselves or being exposed to others and therefore the need to quarantine. And these, these uh, issues related to COVID have led to loss in pay, uh, theoretically, if they were sick or quarantined. Um, although there are uh, systems in place to cover the cost of time lost. However, there is not additional pay necessarily available to cover lost time uh, due to family problems, uh, childcare, homeschool, um, uh, or unless there's a federal program relief fund that will cover that time. And finally, uh, workers are expressing concern over varied uh, COVID policies as they go from one work site to the next and over time. And the transition in those policies is, uh, is very troubling and hard for them to keep up with, adding to the stress and possibly the continued increase in anxiety and depression that we're seeing uh, in, in the workforce. So what are union and contractor workers are, are in, uh, groups doing to support these individuals, these workers? Um, member assistance programs, employee assistance programs have been the go-to for uh, maintaining mental health and uh, balance uh, for workers. Um, however, in many cases that, that's an underutilized service before the pandemic. And so one of our large partner or large unions here in our region, uh, we looked at the utilization of MAP and we actually see in 2020 compared to 2019, a decrease of 28% in calls made to the MAP. Now I am happy to report that those, uh, that trend is improving with greater calls in the more recent weeks. Uh, but obviously we need to be encouraging uh, individuals to utilize that service. With regard to financial support, um, there's been, uh, the unions have done a few things to cover lost time for COVID. They've waived the requirements for the short-term disability. Um, the same union though, when we looked at the rate of utilization of that benefit, we saw no difference between 2019 and to date for 2020. So uh, the service, the uh, benefit has been there, but it's not being readily used as far as we can tell. Uh, but that may be in part because some of the contractors in our area are also covering the employee time loss. And of course, we know there are uh, other benefits uh, that have been offered in the past, at least, for covering uh, time offered due to COVID. So what is happening, what are employers doing to support the mental health of, the, of their workforce? Um, in, in, as we communicate with our contractors, um, we're hearing many different things, but they're all good. Company president messages saying uh, and, and repeatedly saying, it's okay for the workers to stay home if you are sick, your job is secure. And I think that's an important message for them to hear. Um, early on in the pandemic, employees were given the option to stay home if they didn't feel safe. Um, and then uh, they were, uh, the companies worked with each of those employees to help them uh, overcome that. And all of those employees have returned to work. Um, Childcare issues continue to play, uh, uh, be challenging for many of these workers. And it's important that each worker has a different situation and uh, childcare being one of them. Now, taking time off for childcare has not been a paid uh, benefit uh, in, among the uh, contractors locally, but they are guaranteeing the uh, employee maintains their job. So the reassurance from upper management has relieved worker anxiety. Um, other supports uh, are obviously the physical supports that are present at the work site. And we've heard a lot of those over the past few months, the change in um, the uh, staggering of shifts, the hand washing stations, 
the health screening upon entrance, the signage for physical distancing, um, a hotline, COVID hotline, et cetera. And all of these physical changes have allowed the worker to report that they felt better seeing the changes in the work site. They felt that these changes helped them feel the contractor was taking the pandemic seriously. And they liked receiving COVID updates, particularly early in the pandemic. Um, to monitor that mental health of workers, safety personnel are doing many of the things that Doug suggested. Um, they are keeping in close contact with the workers. They're recommending talking to them frequently, having eyes on and monitoring changes in behaviors and attitudes. They're offering support as much as they can and should continue to as uh, the, the pandemic wanes. Uh, they're delivering mental health toolbox talks with suggestions for self-help and, and personal care, but also trying to encourage them, grow that trust, encourage them to seek help through the EAP, and then, of course, utilize those help telephone lines uh, if they need to. It's important to post signs. Uh, contractors are posting signs for the EAP and those hotlines on their website. There's also trainings that are available that, uh, you know, and management as well as individuals can take advantage of to help grow their knowledge of mental health awareness so they can be the support for the workers. So what can we do? Uh, some of the contractors said they try to be as empathetic as possible. They try to give breaks, time off. They've relaxed some of the friction areas, saying not emphasizing when will this be completed, why is this taking so long, because there has to be a mutual understanding that piling more pressure on top uh, in these days is not helpful. It's important to provide clear communication, watch for the signs of distress and changes in behavior. There's many resources out there. Um, and I will encourage you to go to the website that Doug mentioned. There's one from NAMI here for community resources that might be beneficial. And finally, just to emphasize the September is Suicide Prevention Awareness. I'll let Randy talk more about that. But CPWR has uh, resources for the Suicide Prevention Awareness, and these will be uh, available through their website. And the AGC of Missouri also just published their second annual suicide prevention and construction program that is all downloadable through their website. So I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Professor Dale. And we'll go to our final speaker, Randy Croco with Sheet Metal Occupational um, Health Trust and with the uh, Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention. I just want to give a little background about who I am and how I came up to the ranks. I've uh, been in the trade now for over 40 years. I've worked uh, in the construction industry, heating and air conditioning for 24 of those years, and I've worked also as a, um, a union rep in the Wisconsin area for about 10 years, and now I'm the SMOAT uh, director, which is the Sheet Metal Occupational Health Institute Trust. I, I found through those years of of working in, um, I found the actual meeting of people, becoming their friends, knowing who they are, and for some reason in their life, suicide was the answer. And 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 it really upset me to see so many. And then when I took the financial secretary job, I found out that that also was where people would come to talk to you more about their problems and to discuss things and to find out what can I do about if it's stress or, or if it's a substance abuse issue. So I really realized that, you know, we had a lot of issues in the construction industry that are just not being addressed. And so um, coming to uh, on a more of an international level for the safety and health, um, I started to realize that we really needed to do more than what we've been doing. And we had done things over the years Prior to the COVID-19, I mean, everybody deal, dealt with all kinds of other stresses, stresses of getting your job done on time, you know, back, and it's almost hard to think we had to rush our kids to their different practices and things they had to do for school and a, a lot of different stress like that. So when COVID hit, it, it was very unusual 
I would say, to how everything kind of stopped. It seemed like, and, and in fact, and I'll talk a little bit later about, we have a, a 800 number for our members to call a, a helpline. And we had, that was going quite well. And it was, it was weird to me that when this happened, that helpline almost cut off. It was like people, people had like bigger problems, I think, all of a sudden they felt. And, and then realized, well, oh, I need to go back to that helpline and get more help. So as this, as this virus was spreading, people were trying to figure out what, what's next. What, am, you know, how is uh, my new, uh, work going to look like. Some were working from home in the construction industry. There is no working from home. Um, as Dr. Dale mentioned, you know, they're essential workers and they have to be on a job site. And in, in, in some instances, they could be in a potential unsafe environment, depending on how their partners or people they work with are taking the taking this uh, seriously and, and use, donning the right PPE and keeping it on and all that type of stuff. So, you know, a lot of people are thinking, what is my new normal? Is this what it's gonna be like forever? What's going on? And others are just, you know, moving forward and acting like nothing's happening. So we try to figure out, well, how do we address these new feelings of anxiousness and anxiety? Next slide. So we would, uh, we would be working with our, our um, substance, abuse, substance abuse, mental health, and suicide programs that we have. And these are stats, and we've seen a lot of other stats. And like I mentioned, the stats are one thing, but just like with COVID, I feel like, you know, you hear a lot about it, you, you hear all the cases, the numbers of deaths, but unless you know of someone or you've heard of somebody or someone in your family or something, it doesn't quite hit home as much. I realized that when I was in construction and I, I had a few close friends that ended up taking their lives due to, to suicide because things got too bad for them. And, and you just feel like, why couldn't they reach out to somebody? Why couldn't they you know, talk to somebody? But there was always, and there still is, that stigma there about trying to be uh, open with these issues. And I think that's what we have to do and so how do, how do we change that course from where we, we just bottle it up inside of us and we, and we do what we feel we have to do or how do we get help? So what we have done in the sheet, with the sheet metal workers and other organizations have done these similar things and are doing think great things. Um, our, we're called the Sheet Metal Air, Rail and Transportation, which we're lucky we get the acronym of SMART. We put MAP after for Members Assistance Program. And we've, uh, several years ago, our director of education pictured there, Chris Carlo, put, assembled an unbelievable team of experts in the industry. And some you may have heard of, like Sally Spencer Thomas uh, helps us out with this, Ben Court, the, uh, Jeff Mangrum, and many others. And we have, uh, like, this is a three-day program where we would meet at hotels and do this, this uh, training in a smaller group, no more than 25 people. And it just turned out to be a fantastic way of opening up the, the channels of talking to each other and breaking that stigma and seeing that others in your group are dealing with the same issues you're dealing with. And, and if, it's, if it's substance abuse or if it's uh, mental health or, or um, suicidal thoughts or whatever it might be. So we just saw how, how this really caught on and is going great. And we've been doing this now for about four or, five, four or five years of in-person training. But of course, now COVID comes along and you figure, well, now that's kind of ruined that. But in some ways, it's actually helped because we've had so many members out there that couldn't afford to travel or, or the companies pay their way or whatever to go to these classes. And we're now holding virtual classes. In fact, there's one going on this week and uh, they're doing the training virtually. Now, we, you know, we, we miss a little bit of that personal touch where you, when you, I've been in a few of them and you really get to know these folks and it's very complicated to keep that, everything that's said in those classes to yourself, but you know, you get to know them better and, and so forth. So we're missing some of that, but we can still keep that going, keep that open. And some folks who wouldn't have a chance to do this are not getting the chance to, 
to join a training. Construction, Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention, I've recently become a part of that board um, this past year, and it's uh, what a great organization. Um, the folks on, on that board are just all about getting people help. And there's the, num the phone numbers up there, info at preventconstructionsuicide.com. You're gonna find in there, there's, we have uh, our offering through the end of September, um, suicide prevention training um, through Living Works. And I would, I would you know, suggest that you take a look at that website. You'll be able to drill down through all of that information and utilize it. Those, those like I said, they're free through the end of September. This can give you a taste of what's being trained if you have a bigger group or, or own a company and you wanna get your whole uh, company trained, you can work with, um, with our group to get you special pricing to do a whole big group, but right now to do some individuals and if you wanna just see the training, it'll be free to you, they'll give you a license for that. So with that, um, the next slide, just want to mention these are just some different ways that we have done to try to keep the keep everything in the forefront with our membership and you can do this with your company or whoever whoever needs to do this but we put together some wallet cards that's the front and back of the wallet cards um, just a short little saying and it might help somebody it might help yourself if you need it at some point but if you have those wallet cards those are made of a, a nice thin plastic that that are very durable so they, they can be given out readily we get those out to all of our members and we also have done a, a mouse pad uh, just to have in front of everybody right there with the um, national suicide prevention lifeline that's available and our own personal uh, smart map helpline for our members too and then they just put together some helpful resources um, SAMHSA is a great resource for helplines and phone numbers uh, um, that you can call for whatever you need when, when I need something, I always go to CPWR. They're great, El Kosh, all of that. Um, the great resources there, toolbox talks, um, all kinds of things there, and, and a few different others. Some uh, YouTubes on, on job safety in this COVID environment that I thought were interesting. And, and uh, of course, the, uh, the, the Stand Up for Suicide Prevention, that's a campaign. It's, through the Construction Industry Alliance. I would, I would recommend that you sign up for that, take the pledge, and, uh, and you know, we're doing stand down for fall protection. We're now doing stand up for suicide prevention. Um, let's take that pledge and stay together as a group and, and keep that conversation going. Next slide. So that's, that's basically the end of the, my presentation. A few more. Um, things that I have the, just the website there for, for our organization and for the construction suicide uh, prevention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Randy. Appreciate that update. And we'll just jump right into some of the questions. Um, let's let's yeah. go to um, tr suicide trends. And this would be for uh, Professor Dale. Could you uh, comment briefly on the, just what the trends are for suicides in construction? Yeah, so um, I think post-COVID, we aren't sure that the uh, uh, construction workers are necessarily higher, but the national trends are significantly higher, as we know, and we already knew construction was suffering. And um, given what uh, Randy just presented through the alliance, um, you know, and the need for for this, you know, construction and the attention we need to be placing on this. I know, uh, I, I, think, I, I think the data will eventually come out and show that the trends are continuing to grow in construction post COVID. I know locally in our region, there have been several uh, uh, suicides in the construction industry uh, just recently. And uh, that, that's higher than what we've typically had. So, um, I don't think the data is there, but I wouldn't be surprised if the trend's not going to pan out eventually. Okay, thank you. And uh, this question is for Randy, and it has to do with, you know, under the pandemic, we have more limited you know, contact between workers. And are there some indicators that can be used to determine mental health issues, even when you're really not having 
uh, near as much interaction as we've had in the past. Yeah, that's, um, you know, there's a lot of different things that, that could be signs um, of somebody that's having some mental issues. Um, you know, maybe they're, they're a lot more distance, distant than they used to be, or they're, you know, not getting involved uh, like they used to. Um, sometimes you see changes in behaviors too, maybe a lot more anger is coming. To the table. A lot of times what you just see is uh, more distance. They just kind of are to themselves and, and not really participating as they normally would have. Okay, and then is there, uh, do you have any sense of the impact of just the, you know, telecommuting and home life for construction workers that are, that are single? Yeah, I do, and not because I'm single, but because I have a single daughter um, that lives back in Wisconsin, and I know how stressful this has become for her. She's uh, She works in a bank, so now she's able to work from home. She also has two children, though, that are there, and very young children, seven and two, and uh, I don't know how she does it, and, and uh, but I do know some of the the things that she has done to help with that. And she, she does um, chat sessions with her friends. She tries to stay on social media and, and stay connected that way. And she's, she calls us quite a bit. And, you know, it's, it's, it's always good to stay connected in any way that you can. And I, I think that's the key. Try to stay connected during this time. Okay, and a question for uh, Dr. Wiegand is, um... You know, there's there's sort of a stigma around some of these issues. And are there do you have any suggestions about talking to, you know, coworkers about mental health issues and trying to avoid the, the stigmas that, that are associated? Um, yeah. So stigma happens when there's some sort of mark of shame or discredit associated with a particular circumstance, quality, or person. Um, I really think that communication is key here. Uh, especially normalizing things. So uh, during my talk, I really tried to emphasize that, that stress is something normal that everyone goes through. Um, some people are, are worried about their privacy and what others may think if, if they know that they're seeking mental health assistance. Uh, the stigma has gone on, you know, for probably as long as as psychology has existed, even the words mental health or psychologist or therapist seem to arouse discomfort for some. Um, some suggestions I have, it, it may be helpful to classify mental health just simply as well-being and to equate it with uh, physical health. Um, it helps to talk openly and often about mental health. Um, so lots of open talk and attention to the fact that we're all human, we all face challenges, um, that therapy for, for some things is very effective. Um, I think it's important to raise awareness and help educate others about mental health. Um, again, hopefully the information covered here and the resources that we provided today can, can help to do that. Um, another one is just being careful about how you talk about mental health. Uh, many people seem to lack knowledge about um, about mental health and psychology, and in so doing, may may present falsehoods or or try to joke around with things, uh, try to put people down using terms like crazy or you know he or she is bipolar, things like that. Uh, these really aren't helpful and uh, helps to spread stigma. Um, another thing with language that that seems to be more common than it should is that uh, it, try not to use mental health conditions as adjectives. So sometimes you hear people being described as OCD if they happen to be like really organized or, or someone say, uh, might say, oh, the weather's being bipolar and changing a lot. Um, these things have negative connotations and, and increase stigma. Um, so I think just a communication in general and helping to normalize uh, mental health and, and even seeking mental health uh, assistance is very important for reducing stigma. Uh, lastly, I did put in the chat box a link uh, to some information related to stigma and COVID-19. So hopefully that will be helpful for everyone.
Okay, thank you very much. And with that, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. We've uh, gone for an hour. I think it's just been uh, a lot of great information shared. So I'd like to thank uh, CPWR for hosting. I'll thank uh, Chris Kane. Also, want to thank uh, Professor Anne Marie Dale, Prof uh, Dr. Douglas Wiegan, and Randy Krokos. Thank you very much, and have a good rest of your day. Take care, everyone.